I think it's very appropriate for me to be thinking this way right now because post COVID and during COVID, many people have、um, been trying to strive to accept the dynamic of what's happening in the world. And what I'm thinking is alchemy, because instead of striving and driving yourself to go to the next level, I think the process of transformation, of accepting where you're at, what you have, what your dynamic is, what your impasse is, mixing in a pot and coming up with the transformational process, is what I call alchemy. Welcome to Warriors at Work. This is Jeannie Coomber, your guide and host. Warriors at Work is a place where. Everyone in the workplace can come together, gain insight, encouragement, tell stories, connect, and share wisdom. We are a place of like minded people at different stages of life, all coming together with a shared interest of enlightening and inspiring one another. If you're interested in going from the predictable to the potent, and you want to find your warrior magic, Step into the journey with us. Welcome to Warriors at Work. Hey, everybody, it's Jeannie. Thanks so much for joining me here at the Warriors at Work podcast. So, today I have a returning guest with me who's someone I've known for a number of years, Mary Rauer, who's a licensed clinical social worker. She's a registered nurse, she's a certified Imago therapist, certified Imago's couple presenter. She's also a certified EMDR clinician. As well as probably one of the most spiritual beings I have ever had the benefit of knowing. I have learned so much from Mary in her work in the mental health field, but also her spiritual and emotional and heartfelt approach to the world is just inspiring. So, this conversation is talking about the alchemy of relationships. It's a term that Mary herself. Named and alchemy, the way we're talking about psychologically, it can really be thought of as breaking down your sense of self in order to change into a stronger, more aware individual, which is very much in alignment with what we talk about here at the Warriors at Work conversations. And in this conversation, we not only talk about the various modalities. That Mary uses, like attunement or philosophical inquiry, like she talks about it. But we also talk about the most common themes that she's seeing working with individuals and couples and how she approaches those conversations, the ideas that she proposes. She offers us a lot of interesting perspective on things like shadow work, self regulation,、uh, as well as things like. How can we have more transparent, authentic,、uh, trust oriented conversations? How can we move past our own stagnation and loss of individuality to have a more expansive experience and step forward into the life that we really want for ourselves? One of the most fascinating parts to, to this podcast conversation is Mary's approach to relationship styles and doing this. I, This work about transforming deficits into attributes, so relatable to all of us as warriors, whether you're an executive in corporate America, you're an entrepreneur, you're a business owner, or you're an aspiring warrior, you're looking to step into the workplace. This conversation is so relatable on so many levels. And I'm really, really thrilled and proud to bring to you more wisdom from the incredible Mary Rauer. Enjoy. Welcome to the Warriors at Work podcast. This is Jeannie Coomber, your guide and host on this incredible journey. And I have with me an absolute rock star in the world of mental health. And that is Mary Rauer. Mary, thank you so much for joining me here today. Thank you, Jeannie. You have been with me on this ride actually since I started. When I started getting into the podcast world, you and I first started our conversations on feminine and masculine. You came back to talk about some relationship experiences that you were seeing in your private practice over the course of the pandemic. And for those of you who don't remember Mary, not only is she a licensed clinical social worker, 
She's a registered nurse. She's a certified Imago therapist. She's a certified Imago couples workshop presenter, which personally I have attended. Amazing. She also does this incredible modality called EMDR. And I say all of that to share with you that Mary is a very grounded, I would call you a holistic practitioner in many ways. And she's incredibly skilled as a therapist. She's also a mom. I think you're a grandmother too. Yes, I am. <laughs> and she's probably one of the most spiritual beings that I've ever encountered in my lifetime. And I've known her personally, professionally, and I'm always thrilled to have a conversation about relationships with you, Mary. And I, I wanted to set the stage because you're so much more than just the credentials I read. Um, and a big part of this platform is to not just talk about the intellectual and the leadership tactics, but we get into the spiritual, we get into the mental, we get into the emotional. And in my mind, you're the resource I go to for the mental and emotional aspect of this journey. And what we're talking about today is a, is a term that you had mentioned to me when we were preparing for this, which was this idea of the alchemy of relationships. And for those who, who are not as familiar with that term, I looked it up. And I wanted to give a little context, and then I'm going to ask you to share a little bit more about why alchemy. But the original definition is this idea of trying to transform base metals like lead into more valuable metals like gold. But in our contemporary way of being, alchemy is a term used to describe the transformative process people consciously engage with. And psychologically, it can be thought of as breaking down your sense of self in order to change into a stronger, more aware individual, which is exactly what we're talking about at the Warriors at Work podcast and in the show and all of this work. And it's considering your old self, the lead, that's going to be transformed. And I would love to just ask you, why alchemy? Why alchemy of relationships? Well, to begin with, I think it's very appropriate for me to be thinking this way right now because I am feeling like as if post-COVID and during COVID, many people have um, been trying to strive to accept the dynamic of what's happening in the world. And what I'm thinking is alchemy because instead of striving and driving yourself to go to the next level, I think the process of transformation of accepting where you're at what you have, what your dynamic is, what your impasse is, mixing in a pot and coming up with the transformational process is what I call alchemy. Mm. Accepting where you are. I think that's probably one of the biggest difficulties because we, I would imagine, I'm saying this from my personal experience, but also from what mm -hmm. I've seen is we crave what was, we miss, we grieve what was, we still feel in a bit of an, a level of uncertainty so we have a lot of fear around what's coming. And so like right. our foundation um, is very off. It's kind of like so when someone throws you off your footing, you're not sure mm -hmm. where you are. It's fascinating. And we're going to break this down. And, and you use a lot of modalities. I made mention of EMDR, which I'm not sure exactly what that means. I think it's eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Yeah. Imago, family systems. Uh, they're like your bookends. And mm -hmm. I see you as an alchemist for others, what you stand for, how you help others break down um, who, th who they think they are and really help them find who they are in their most strongest, clear self, both individuals mm -hmm. and couples. And mm -hmm. as an alchemist, what are you listening and watching for with your clients? Well, basically what I'm doing is um, I'm transmuting the present day awareness of what I see in the moment, the, the, the presentational self, the way the person presents himself there. I listen to what they want and I basically give them what they need, which is alchemists basically listen for stumbling blocks, um, unprocessed developmental traumas, um, developmental deficits from childhood, um, family, family core needs that were not met. I kind of listen to all of that. And then from there, I kind of fit into the melting pot, whatever modality I'm trained in, into helping the individual or the couple fill the gap. Well, as a coach, that makes a lot of sense to me. So I listen for what, what's the challenge, but where's the challenge? What's the challenge rooted in? 
And then what mm-hmm. are the skills and or advice or resources or modalities that I could offer to help address wherever that tension or that pain point is. So it's mine is more in the constructive forward thinking pr- productivity mindset. Yours is who they are in the world. Where are some of those where, what are some of those challenges where people are getting stuck? And then, you, then you're using those modalities as a way to get them to explore it. Did I hear that it, right? Exactly, exactly. And in psychotherapy, you know, I use the skill of attunement. You kind of meet mm. people where they're at. And then I bring in, you know, I have a very strong uh, chart, you know, a, a belief system and teaching. And I have a lot of philosophical inquiries. So the combination you know, I can listen, break it down conceptually, and then teach them the pattern they're they're in. And then I can either put it towards a developmental model, a trauma model, a spiritual model, an intentional dialogue model, wherever they are. Mm. Philosophical inquiry. I have never heard that term. Can you say more about that? Yes. I think it's just like, you know, the depth of you know, looking into, you know, your own unmet needs, your core values, your core strengths, and kind of like leading it back to, um, you know, whether it's bibliotherapy, you know, reading something, or whether it's a spiritual dimension of finding your inner purpose, your inner path, just an inquiry, a curiosity towards the spiritual elements in the world, religions, music, art. Mm. And you, you talked a little bit about Imago and family systems. Can you just elaborate on what those two modalities are about? Yeah, I'm pretty, uh, specifically referencing internal family systems, which is a model by Richard Schwartz. And it's the use every within every person, that there is many sense of the self. So there's a core self, which is competent, curious, um, calm. There's a lot of uh, words that develop the core self. But within the core self, the ego strength, then there are different parts of a person, a child part, an adolescent part, an entrepreneurial part, a a working part. So therefore the core self works with the parts of self. You you connect to the child part within yourself. You use your own internal family system to do the work. Um, That's a beautiful model and it's a very loving, kind, compassionate model. And in Imago therapy, it's really the beautiful theory of we marry or connect with or um, have partners who either have similar backgrounds the way we were raised and or different. So we're drawn to someone who, you know, either replicates our childhood or is the opposite. And then through the unmet needs of the couple or the individual, you can create all the wounding to be helped or cured through the environment, through people, through the relationship partner. Yeah, that having experienced (laughs) all three of those, I can personally attest on how incredible Mm. it was because it, it surfaces things that we just don't have awareness to or a line of sight to. And then what you're extraordinary at is getting you to not only see it, but to understand it. And I think that's a key piece to this is to intellectualize what's Mm. actually happening and then providing skills and abilities to to move through it in a way so that you can move past the wound. It doesn't mean the wound goes away, it's just move past it. And you, it's like you put it into another part of your psychological way of being and refer back to it now as I, when I was in that place, this is what I learned and this is how I'm gonna apply that forward. I I love that. Um, All of those modalities were incredibly powerful. So I'm curious, What is the most common theme right now you're seeing working with, let's start with individuals and then we'll talk about couples. Oh, that's a great question, Jeannie. Um, With individuals I'm seeing, I think again, because of the mindful awareness of where we are today, there has been a lot of um, isolation, disconnection, loneliness, um, therefore fear, anxiety, and a lot of energetic disruption due to the fact that people are just not, you know, connected. They're not out there. They're not having attachment with, you know, society as much as they were. So, you know, that's what I do with those um, individuals is I kind of try to get them into the window of uh, tolerance. Like, let's see how you cope with isolation in a different way. Instead of being hyper aroused and running around and being super frenetic, you know, you have to bring them back to a window of arousal, which is kind of like calm centered 
and people that are avoidant, just staying home, not going out of the house, you know, just because of, of, of their own anxiety, they're more under aroused and they're, you need to help those people bring up their energy level to, again, you know, work with acceptance of what's going on. Mm. And what about on the couple side? That's the fun work. Um, they're both they're both very en energetic and exciting for me because I see more with couples. It's very interesting. A lot of stagnation, and a lot of symbiotic relationships. You know, basically meaning there's so much time spent together that people are you know becoming like two amoebas in a petri dish. I always say in therapy, or uh, the loss of individuation, the loss of you know separateness, uh, differentiation. So with those couples, with most couples, I'm working a lot on present day and future templates, where you want to go because of what you've learned about yourself throughout this you know, time period, what's happening within you. And there's a lot of energy and a lot of movement with couples right now. I feel like we're in a really unique inflection point. Pandemic really started March, 2020. Here we are mid-May, 2021. You're starting to see some opening. I don't even know if the word is like return to what was, I don't believe that's ever going to happen, but there's some sort of opening that's happening mm -hmm. and there needs to be another iteration of the, the coupling. It's really, really interesting. And I think everything you just said, I, which goes back to your opening thoughts, it's like, you need to acknowledge where you are and whatever part mm -hmm. of that journey. Mm -hmm. And I love the idea of, a, of attunement to that too, is mm -hmm. acknowledge where you are and, and whether you're in a, in a relationship or you're an individual, it's figuring out what's happening in the environment around me and not making it wrong. Mm -hmm. It's just seeing exactly. what it is. And then is it, is it getting into dialogue and asking questions? Is it asking for help? Like where, so once we've identified where we are, as we're going through whatever this next transition is going to look like, um, what happens next? Well, I think uh, I'll tell you specifically what I do in the work is I'll have couples check into what's underneath or what's happening underneath the, the behavior or the what's going on. Meaning what is the feeling underneath the behavior that you're exhibiting? You know, whether you're feeling stuck or enmeshed or fused or something like that. And then I think the next step is to really to take it. It's, it's an imago stem. It's a sentence stem that we use, which is three words. What hurts me, what scares me, what that reminds me of. So I can bring, okay, what's going on right now? What's the feeling that you're experiencing right now? You know, with this new expansion of the society, um, is there a hurt there? Is there a fear? Is, are you afraid? And then from there moving forward. Mm. Hurts, scares, reminds me of. Right. I, wrote that, I wrote that down. That one is really good for, for yeah. parent, parenting too, as kids yeah. are going yeah. through, again, whatever that expansion or transition looks like for them. Mm -hmm. yeah. The other thing that was really interesting as we were preparing for this conversation, you shared the approach of learning relationship styles, then transforming deficits into attributes is one of your favorite areas of exploration. So can you say more about that? Yes, absolutely, Jeannie. I um, basically I can see whether it's an individual or a couple where the pattern is, what stage of development uh, people are at. So, for example, you know, couples are usually connected at a stage like a developmental stage, like attachment or competency or or intimacy. So, therefore, you look at what stage they're at, you kind of identify it, and let's say the deficit is the inability to socially feel comfortable you kind of have the couple meet that need within each other and then together as a couple to move them to the next stage. Move them to the next stage. So like, what are the most common stages? You, you meet someone in and then where are they moving to? I would say attachment couples, usually, you know, those are the couples that need a lot of physical touch, a lot of nurturance, a lot of emotional bonding, less verbalization. You know, once that's met and they feel really connected, you can move them up into the, the phase of uh, exploration and individuation and separating from each other and growing on that level. Competency couples are, you know, more focused on achievement and orientation to drive and what they accomplish in their life. Once they realize that and they meet that need through each other or through friendships or the world, then they can move on to more of an intimacy level.
And I feel like a lot of the people who follow me and the warriors at work fit into that competence model, whether they're both working or one has a more powerful role or a more demanding role. Do you see that a lot too, where you, there's a little bit, I don't like the word inequity, but it's the only one that's coming to mind is that one has much more of a, much more demand on their time and commitment. And the other one may have less. What typically is their evolution? Well, first of all, you want to make it more egalitarian, you know, more shared on any level you can, if you can. Yeah. Um, so there, so on that, I purposely talked about competency now because I thought that would be appropriate for where we're at right now. But that couple will be able to, this can be very involved conversation, but involved and evolved, but it's more dropping into the shadow work, which is my other favorite work, which is once a couple can balance a little bit more the power differential and they acknowledge it, then they can drop into the part of them that is underdeveloped, you know, competency, you know, kind of forms between the ages of seven and 12, the, that stage of life. And once you realize that you fulfill the competency, the couple's working on being more balanced, more egalitarian, then the denied traits, the disowned traits, the shadow work, the part of them that's not developed uh, is worked on within the person and within the couple. Make sense? Yeah. All of us have shadow sides, right? Yeah. So yeah. is there some way to attune yourself to your shadow side? Oh, absolutely. It's very easy. All you have to do is think about who drives you crazy and why, and that's your shadow. Um. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and then once, once you've identified that person, then what? The reason you need to look at your shadow, it's because it's an unconscious trait. So you either project it you know, I, I don't like that person because, which is really about you, or you act it out. So once you own your shadow and you see the work, you integrate it, and you start working on, uh, like, for example, my shadow would be entitlement. You know, those are the, I have difficulty with extreme entitlement, but you form a more adaptive sense of entitlement within yourself. So mm -hmm. that's the answer. Whatever's driving you crazy, um, you know, people spring up all kinds of, one time I did a workshop and I had about 500 people yelling out to me, they're the people they can, that, that frustrate them. And then, you know, we put them into categories and typically it's stingy, lazy, you know, words like that. So you have them not say that, okay, I am now going to be a, a stingy person. You find a more adaptive way that you could be more, you know, freer with money or you see what I'm saying, or more withholding, learning about money. If entitlement would be, adaptive entitlement would be a healthy sense of entitlement, which is, you know, putting yourself before other people's needs all the time, things like that. Adaptive. So it's, it's, it's a, a productive or constructive way of yes. soothing or addressing the, um, mm -hmm. the style. Like mine is uh, people who play victim, all right. who, who will overplay right. it. So if I were to use your framing, the shadow side of me, it's, I probably didn't get enough attention on certain things, right. exactly. which is why that irks me uh, when I see people that are overplaying, oh, woe is me. So mm -hmm. the adaptive style would be, how could I self-care more, give myself more room to learn or grow through something? Yes. You look at what does it, you look at the positive attributes of a victim. What does a victim get? They get attention, they get power, they get noticed. So then you look for adaptive ways that you can become noticed, you know, have a little bit more power interpersonally, things like that. You just take the negative and transfer it to a positive. That right there uh, might be the most important technique anyone has shared with me this month so far. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. So I want to talk a little bit, uh, take a little bit of a different tact here because there might be people listening. They're afraid 
to go back mm-hmm. to what because when when you hear of therapy, especially the word like alchemy, uh, which is a really mm-hmm. big word, um, heavy mm-hmm. in some ways, there might be people mm-hmm. listening that are just afraid to go into this therapy conversation or in their mind, go back to the past to address the present or the future. What would you say to them to give them a level of comfort? Because what we're really talking about, this is self exploration. So how would you bring them to a place of peace and openness to this? Well, I would begin with, and I do begin with the fact that we never have to go back and re-examine and re-explore every ounce of the past. You just want to work with what's mindfully present in the moment today. Basically, you, you know, you're here now. So um, of course, if a trigger shows up, if, a, if some kind of memory shows up, you just notice it. You just accept it. You don't have to go through a forgiveness pattern or, you know, you know, relinquishing the past in some kind of big process. You just accept and notice and have a mindful presence to this moment. Having gone through the last year or so, you've heard a lot of stories and experiences from clients. What do you think we need more of mentally, emotionally, and spiritually? I think basically we need a lot of transparency authenticity. I think the number one aspect of the current current day is that we need trust in ourselves. There's a really high need for self-regulation, uh, which means daily practice. And I could say hope, but I'm, I'm, more, I'm more focused on transparency and trust. Can you say more about self-regulation and, and even offer up what is, what is a really good way to, to step into that? And the reason I'm highlighting it, there's there's just a lot of uh, there's a lot of energy and a lot of drive happening in the workplace right now, and it, it shows up in various ways. The one that I see most common is the back to back video meetings and or phone calls. So we've mm-hmm. transferred our need to be in the office in meetings all day long to now being on video all day long or on phone mm-hmm. calls all day long, mm-hmm. and I feel like we've lost a little bit of our humanness. We're back to Mm -hmm. transactional head down production. Let's get stuff done, get it done, get it done, get it done. And it worries me because we're, we're missing some of those aspects. And so the self-regulation, we're not paying attention Mm -hmm. or we're, you know, we're half listening. We're making Mm -hmm. a lot of story up around what we think people are saying and doing. We're also, there's a ton of assumptions. We're short tempered. We're not sleeping Mm -hmm. great. Um, and I'm mm-hmm. just not a full a blanket statement, but it's a common theme that I'm seeing and I'm worried about it. So, so mm-hmm. talk to us about the self-regulation part. Self-regulation basically is affect, uh, regulation. Affect is really emotional state. So, you know, I just put it into terms from being, having a medical background, I put everything to terms of, um, understanding the body. So, you know, you have something called the autonomic nervous system, which is, you know, parasympathetic, you know, sympathetic nervous system. And I used the word before window of arousal. Um, So basically picture like a window, a window frame, and then you have the top of the window, the middle of the window, the bottom of the window. So what you just said is, you know, we're on zoom. I mean, I'm in the same world uh, as that, as what you just spoke about. Um, Mm. You know, you're either constantly between being not listening or connecting or, or being, you know, no breaks or not enough food or too many hours. Basically, when you talk about things that are out there in the world, like breath work, meditation, yoga, all that means is you use a modality to self-regulate the body, which then affects the emotional state. So how do you do that? Because, you know, if you think about it, you're either at the top of the window, you know, racing around the top of that, you're either the bottom, which is shut down, disconnected, dissociative, whatever that is, by doing breath work, by doing, you know, I have a yoga mat in the office in between sessions. I'm just down there doing some pose just to bring myself back into the window of arousal, which is that healthy state of being where you can be attentive. Mm. I love the visual top of the window, bottom of the window. That's mm. very helpful. I think even just anybody listening to this to ask themselves, where am I in that window? Mm-hmm. And, and then 
who are those people that are driving you crazy? Because now you also have this opportunity to investigate the shadow side. So you got, yeah, <laughs> exactly. it's, like a, it's a full uh, transformative therapeutic and, and mental evolution in any work day right now. <laughs> yes, it is. It definitely is. That so, would be a great workshop. It would be. It really yeah. would be. What you know? What I'd love to do is let let's take it back. I like to take it back to personally to to the guests because we've hit on a lot of things from your toolkit as a therapist who's been doing this work for decades, and you've seen so many mm-hmm. different things. I'd love to mm-hmm. talk more about you. We talk a lot about in this community this idea of creating a movement of thinkers and doers, and. I am also a huge believer in the power of community and not doing it all alone. And I have people who keep me accountable to what I say I'm looking to create and also helping me stay aligned with the best version of myself. Who are those people in your community that help you stay accountable and help you to evolve and grow? Well, I think it, again, going back to the philosophical inquiry kind of um, idea, uh, I'm an avid, curious learner. You know, there's so much I don't know and still want to learn. So I use, I actually have a spiritual teacher, which I work with in depth. And through that work, you know, I use the Course in Miracles and a lot of personal work on the Enneagram. Are you familiar with that? I am. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I kind of just, you know, use my Enneagram work to help me along with that. I have a very strong background. In 15 years, I've been going to, you know, acupuncture and homeopathy and Basically, the combination of those three keeps me pretty grounded. If you could share a little bit about Enneagram with those who don't know about it. Uh, basically, I just tell people it's the, the learning the spiritual dimension of your personality style. You know, your, they're, they're numbers from one to nine. And you can easily take a test and understand what number you kind of correlate with the most. And that personality style is formulated from the way you were raised, your adaptation to your family of origin. So, for example, I'm a anyone would know me who knows me know that I'm a classic too. It's a helper. It's a others directed. Uh, you know, I relate to people through emotionality. Um, but you know, that there's, there's, there's deficits and there's as attributes and there's growth in learning what your type is to move to the next level, just like the developmental stages of a couple. I'm doing a lot of self work on moving to the next level. Mm. And how do you stay relevant and informed? I think almost every month I have some kind of training or workshop, or I'm a very big participant in trying to get involved in clinical studies where I'll just be a participant. For example, I just finished an eight week um, course in um, meditation course with a Canadian psychologist on the the effects of mindful meditation combined with um, um, EFT, which is a form of psychotherapy to reduce anxiety levels. Mm. So I, part- I participate, I learn, I get certified, I get trained, I maintain CEUs. And what about in your warrior journey? You know, what, what are those things that you're struggling with or, or you're stuck around? Well, because I think at this point in my life, you know, as I said before, I'm a grandmother. So I have, you know, I think a lot about the epigenetics of what can still change within me to transform my genetic predisposition to, you know, to my family. But I'm very, very interested in trying to see uh, or create or be involved in a, a world locally, uh, you know, in my community and within the, the framework of anyone I run into to, de- uh, to have a deeper conversational depth, a more genuine, transparent conversational, you know, connection to people. Amen to that, Mary. Amen to that. Mm. I would imagine people are coming to you because, and you hear all of it, you're hearing the personal, the professional, the emotional, the Mm -hmm. spiritual, but there's, there is a uh, resistance to having broader discussion on the depths Mm -hmm. that I think we need, um, Mm -hmm. especially coming out of such an extraordinary time in our lives. There's so Mm There's so much richness here. There's so many dimensions to all of our stories and all of our experiences. I completely support that idea of more conversational depth. So last question, what are the resources, thought leaders that we all could follow? If for anybody who wants to become an alchemist like Mary, Mm -hmm. um, what should we be doing? What should we, who should we be following? I think you should be following, uh, again, I'm going to keep uh, focusing right now on the Enneagram work because I think since I come from that kind of 
spiritual dimension, I think understanding, even if you don't do anything about it, just kind of identify your personality style, because it tells you a lot about how you're perceived, you know, we're not always consciously aware of what other people think about us. And if you kind of know your type, you kind of have a better awareness of, you know, your interactions with others. So, um, but I really do believe um, I, I, if anyone's really interested in looking to the interpersonal neurobiology of what's happening right now, follow Dan Siegel. Um, and I always refer back to Harville Hendricks's work with imagotherapy because his, the shadow work, the, the work I love is through his work to work with individuals and singles. So I think, you know, I can throw in there Francine Shapiro, the EMDR, Richard Schwartz, IFS. And you said Dan Siegel was the first person on interpersonal neurobiology. Neurobiology. And and what is what do you mean by that? What actually happens within the chemistry of the brain, what actually happens into the that's basically the whole premise of attunement, you know. There's mm. something called mi- mirror neurons in our in our frontal lobe. So when you talk to someone and you're attuned, it's almost like you're rebonding the the person and you're actually connecting to the mirror neurons, the the interpersonal neurobiology, the brain chemistry. When you actually gaze, look, attentive, pay attention, listen, that's what it is. It's like sinking. Sinking, exactly. I love exactly. that. Well, Mary, as always. You are a wealth of information and ideas and practicalities. And I'm so grateful for you sharing your wisdom with me, with all of the listeners in the Warriors at Work community. And I'm so appreciative that you're doing you in the world and helping so many people. Oh, thank you, Jenny. I just really love the opportunity to um, let people know what's going on with them within this brand of mine. And hopefully we can have some more (laughs) conversational depth with many. Thanks everybody for listening to another episode of Warriors at Work and letting us be a part of your warrior journey. You can ask questions and make suggestions for future topics at jc at jeanniecoomber.com. Connect with me personally on LinkedIn and Instagram and join us on the Warrior Conversations channel on YouTube and at the Warrior Magic Community page on Facebook. You can find links to all these places on my website, JeannieCoomer.com. And most importantly, be sure to tell friends about us, subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes, Spreaker, and Spotify. It helps others find the show and puts more Warrior Magic out into the world.